Hi, I'm Christopher Millard. I'm off council with Bristow's and I'm a professor of privacy and information law at Queen Mary, University of London, where I lead the cloud legal project. I want to talk for a few minutes about protection of personal data in clouds, or as you would hear in the US, personally identifiable information about people. In the European Union, we have some quite detailed and complex and sometimes controversial rules about what can be done with other people's personal data. And applying these rules to cloud computing environments can be quite tricky. The first question indeed is a really fundamental question. What types of information that might be processed and stored in a cloud computing environment are regulated as personal data? Now that might seem obvious. Well, if it's information about an identifiable living individual, which is the test for personal data, and if it's in a cloud computing environment, then it will be regulated as personal data. But actually, it isn't that simple in practice. Because quite a lot of information that gets processed using cloud computing services may start out being information about an identifiable individual, but by the time it gets to the cloud computing service provider, it may no longer be identifiable information about a particular person. Let me give you an example. If you have a laptop um, or other device on which you process information and store data, it's quite possible to back that up to a cloud service provider for backup and storage and disaster recovery purposes, but to do so in a way that before it leaves your laptop or other device, it has been securely encrypted and provided you, the user or the customer, keep that key in your own possession and you don't disclose it to the cloud service provider, then when the information is received and stored on the cloud service provider's equipment, it's no longer information in an identifiable form about particular people. So could we perhaps argue then that it's possible that the same information, which is clearly personal data in my hands, because I can read it, I know who all these people are, might not be personal data when it's been encrypted in a way that means it cannot be read by somebody else, such as a cloud service provider. A more subtle variation on that question is, well, what happens if you just do something to the information to make it difficult or perhaps impossible for somebody else to work out who it is? You don't encrypt it necessarily to make it meaningless information, meaningless data for somebody else reading it, but you take out by anonymizing the data, you take out links, identifiers that would enable anybody else to work out who the individuals are. That's a difficult gray area. It's quite contentious and many data protection regulators are currently concerned about anonymization as a technique for protecting uh, individuals when their data are being processed by third parties, including cloud service providers. And the reason they're concerned is that technology and technological developments are moving so fast at the moment that although it's possible you may have done things to your data to make it impossible today for somebody else to work out who the individuals are in your database, within months, within years, it may well be that uh, very sophisticated um, data matching and data analytics techniques will become available that make it possible for people to make those connections again, perhaps using data that you never had in the first place, but they got from somewhere else, and they do uh, profiling and matching and data analytics so that they can work out who these supposedly anonymous people are. So that's the first fundamental question. Um, what information is protected and regulated as personal data in clouds? Second fundamental question is, who is responsible for personal data in clouds? Again, uh, that might seem obvious. You might think, well, if, if I'm trusting my data to some cloud service provider, then they must be responsible for it. That may be true, but I think often it's too simplistic an analysis, and I'll tell you why. If the cloud customer, and again, that could be me, for example, if I have done something to the data, and I gave the example earlier of encrypting the data so that it can't be read by the cloud service provider, then why should that service provider be responsible for compliance with data protection law as regards that information? Indeed, they may not even know that they are handling personal data. I might have sent them 
information in a form that they have no idea what it is. Now, as it happens at the moment, and I think this is unfortunate, the way data protection laws have traditionally been drafted and interpreted by regulators and courts, if information is personal data in my hands, or it's been personal data in somebody else's hands, uh, and if it is possible then to work out who the uh, randomized, meaningless, perhaps anonymized, pseudonymized, encrypted data in somebody else's hands, if you can re reverse engineer that effectively, maybe using a key to unlock the encryption, some regulators will say, well, it's still personal data, it's just that they can't read it at the moment. The problem with that approach is that the kind of obligations that are imposed on service providers, and they're typically, at least in the EU, called data processors, um, who provide services to data controllers, um, there are certain assumptions made about what they are processing, what power they have to do things with data. Uh, and they include fundamental things like keeping the data secure and only processing it in a way that's consistent with instructions given by the data controller. But if they don't even know uh, what data they have, then appropriate technical and organizational security measures may be very difficult uh, to work out. And as for the instructions requirement, the idea that the data controller tells the data processor exactly how to process the data, what security arrangements to have in place, and so on, that doesn't really make sense. If you're looking at a very large scale cloud infrastructure environment, for example, where one major cloud uh, service provider it could be Amazon, it could be uh, Microsoft, Google, HP, IBM, and so on. They may have millions of customers using their data centers and using their infrastructure. And the idea that each of those customers could give them instructions saying, this is how you must process my data. These are the security arrangements you have to put in place in relation to the data I entrust you with. That doesn't really work um, on that kind of scale and where the direction of travel has been reversed. So it's not a case of I've got my IT processing operations already up and running and I'm asking somebody else to run them for me. It's, it's very different to that. Here, you are buying a, a pre-existing service that's already been built, already has security arrangements in place, and it's not feasible for that then to be customized for very large numbers of, of different users of the service. So we've talked about what information is regulated as personal data in clouds. We've looked at who's responsible for the personal data that is put into cloud environments. Third fundamental question is, which laws apply to personal data in clouds? And how far, um, either in theory uh, or perhaps more interestingly in practice, can those laws really reach? Now, many data protection laws have a very long arm reach. And that's particularly true for laws that have been implemented uh, based on the European Union Data Protection Directive. And there are two ways in which these laws can have long arm reach. Firstly, if an organization is established in an EU member state and it then processes personal data in the course of that establishment, that member state's law applies to the processing activities regardless of where in the world the individuals are to whom the data relate, and even regardless of where in the world the processing activity takes place. So in that sense, uh, going outwards, the national laws in the EU based on the Data Protection Directive have potentially got global reach. If you're processing personal data in the course of your establishment in an EU member state, then that processing is regulated in, in effectively, in theory at least, sorry, it's re regulated worldwide. Now, whether in practice your national regulator in Germany or France or the UK or Ireland can really um, impose any kind of effective supervision and controls on your processing all over the planet, that's another discussion entirely, and I would be a little bit skeptical about that. But in theory at least, going outwards, if you're processing data in the course of your establishment in an EU member state, it's regulated potentially globally. But there's another way in which these laws have a very long arm reach. And I would call that the, the inbound uh, type of long arm regulation. And what happens here is you might, for example, be a US corporation and you might be um, running all your operations in the US, have all your staff there. You might not be established in any kind of corporate sense in Europe. But if you use equipment, 
um, or means of processing, the directive also says, equipment or means to process data in the EU, then you may end up being regulated by one or more of the national data protection laws. Now, there are a number of ways that could happen. Uh, for example, you may store information on a particular customer's device in the course of doing business with them. Maybe you're an e-commerce merchant and you're in the US, and when people visit your site, you place a cookie, which is a text file, basically, and you can place that on a laptop or a uh, tablet or a smartphone or some other device. And that enables you then to do certain things during that browsing session. But in some cases, in the case of what we call persistent cookies, it means that certain information can be stored and reused when somebody visits that particular e-commerce site again. The view of the EU national data protection regulators is that something as simple as placing a cookie remotely from the US on a device in the EU constitutes using equipment in or means in the EU to process personal data. So even though you're a US company, you're not established here, you don't have any employees here, you don't have any facilities here, you don't have any anything here really except customers or potential customers, that may be enough to make uh, one or more, potentially 28 laws in the 28 EU member states apply to you and your online activities. So in terms of which laws apply and how far do they reach, when we look at cloud computing, which potentially can be a service delivered from anywhere on the planet to anywhere else on the planet, uh, I'm sure you can see that very quickly it becomes extremely complicated because multiple laws, which may or may not be consistent with each other when applied to a particular set of facts, may apply at the same time to activities in a cloud computing environment. And that includes uh, rules on what you have to tell people about their personal data you're going to process, uh, whether you're going to disclose it to other people, um, anything that's really not obvious about what you're going to do with their information, you have to uh, be transparent about that and explain to them. But there are some more um, technical in the legal sense uh, issues as well because one of the key features of data protection laws in the European Union and many other countries is, as a kind of anti-avoidance measure, there is a restriction on exporting personal data from that particular country to another part of the world where there may not be a, an adequate level of protection. Now, adequacy, adequate level of protection is a term of art. It's a whole topic that I'm not going to get into now, but it means that for cloud computing, where information is moved around between different devices and data centers for different purposes. Some of them are background technical processing. Some of them are foreground functions that are being delivered and used. It very quickly becomes difficult to comply with rules that regulate the cross-border transfer of personal data, including rules that would apply where a cloud service provider or an e-commerce provider outside the EU um, is, is regulated under uh, the data protection law of one or more EU member states and finds that then in theory at least there are restrictions on moving data back to where they started. Indeed in an extreme case you might find that a cloud computing service provider in the US in servicing its US customers might keep a backup copy of personal data or some of the data on a server in the EU. That really has nothing to do with the EU in terms of protecting individuals. It's not about people who are citizens of a member state. It's not about people even resident here. This is about customers in the US using a US service. Just because a copy of part of the information is stored in the EU, then those data export rules may apply. I personally don't think that is appropriate or realistic in terms of compliance. So we've looked at what information is regulated, who's responsible, which laws apply, and how far do they reach. I just want to ask a couple more questions though. One is, what about data security in clouds? Because this is one of the issues that is most commonly raised as a reason why potential cloud customers are uncomfortable, maybe not prepared in terms of compliance risk to move data, particularly personal data, to a cloud computing service provider. Well, it's an easy thing to state, is there a security risk if I put my data in some remote processing service? But it's important to look at what actually happens in practice and what the risks are and how they might be managed. And the first question to ask, well, who is responsible for security? To what standard can you check, in fact, whether they are 
meeting their own commitments in terms of security. It's also worth considering um, how good the customer is at doing security themselves in the first place. And what we're finding in practice is that many organizations, even large and sophisticated organizations like major corporations and governments, have not been terribly good at managing IT security in complex environments where they have large amounts of data relating to their employees and customers and others. And it turns out, uh, so far at least, that for the very large cloud service providers, which for their core business look after and keep data secure, uh, it, it looks like at least for small and medium sized organizations, but also potentially for large companies and governments, that using a specialist cloud service uh, may end up being better in terms of security than very large numbers of organizations trying to do their own security uh, on an atomized basis. There are some questions though you need to ask if you are going to entrust data to a cloud service provider that's covered by data protection laws or perhaps regulated in some other way. And I've said first of all, well, what's the security standard and who's responsible for it? But you also need to think about how could you check? What about data audits? And the easy answer to that is, well, I'll make sure my contract says I can go in and inspect the cloud service providers uh, facilities and make sure that their security is adequate and it's what they promised me. Actually, that turns out not to make a lot of sense in practice in most cases because a very large provider of public cloud services will typically have a large number of customers using the same physical infrastructure because the way cloud technology works using virtualization software, it's possible to separate conceptually physical IT resources from virtual machines running on those physical resources. And uh, if you think about that for a moment, ironically, security risks may um, be exacerbated if lots of different customers can go in and audit and test, maybe even do remote penetration testing on resources that are shared with many other customers. So it's not obviously a good thing that um, each customer should have a right to conduct an audit or an inspection for themselves. And indeed, that's starting to become clear enough that some of the regulators are accepting that it makes more sense to have a trusted third party undertake an audit and check that the security arrangements are indeed as the cloud service provider claims they are and that that check is repeated on a regular basis. And then that uh, report can be made available to a large number of customers if appropriate. The last question I want to ask, having talked about what's regulated, who's responsible, which laws apply, and what about security? The last question I want to ask is, will the highly publicized and very controversial um, reforms of EU data protection law, which are being debated uh, at the moment and will be probably in process for some time, will they actually help or hinder the use of cloud computing resources to process personal data in a way that is safe and secure and accountable. Now, one would hope, especially because the European Commission claims that a key catalyst for reform of data protection in the EU is to facilitate technologies like cloud computing and new services in this area, one would hope that the proposed data protection regulation would indeed make it easier for people to understand and be clear uh, about who is responsible, what they're responsible for, uh, how the law applies, where it applies, how it will be policed and enforced. Sadly, at least at the moment, based on the initial draft that was published and proposed by the European Commission in, in January 2012, and based on thousands of amendments that have been tabled uh, pr as proposed changes to that draft, and based on debates uh, that have taken place extensively in the European Parliament and the Council of Ministers and elsewhere, at the moment, it doesn't look as though the proposed reform of EU data protection law will facilitate uh, safe cloud computing in a way that can be easily understood and supervised. And my reasons for being concerned about that are that the current proposals envisage much greater and much more detailed compliance obligations being imposed on both data controllers and data processors. The data controller being the, typically an organization 
that determines the purposes for which data are processed and how they are processed. And then the data processor being typically another organization which actually carries out processing activities as an agent for the controller. So in a cloud environment, that would mean a customer, perhaps a, a company or a government department, which is the data controller, entrusting data to a cloud service provider, which is the data processor. That's the traditional model that's been around for more than 40 years in data protection law, but it doesn't work very well, and in some cases it doesn't work at all in complex cloud computing ecosystems. And yet the proposed reform of EU data protection law would entrench that basic concept even more deeply, and it would add additional obligations in terms of detailed record keeping and risk analysis and so on on both controllers and processors. That is not going to help and facilitate the development of cloud computing services. Another promised benefit of the EU data protection reform is that instead of having to deal with up to 28 national data protection regulators in the EU, and indeed 31 if you count the EEA countries as well, it would be possible to go to one national regulator on a one-stop shop basis. That's the terminology that's been used. And so based on some complicated rules, which at the moment are unfortunately not clear, you would be able to say, this is the regulator that I am accountable to, and as long as I deal with them in an appropriate way, I will not have to go and knock on the door of all these other regulators as well, and run the risk actually not only of substantial delays in deploying and using services, but the risk that you will get inconsistent advice or rulings from multiple regulators. At the moment, the way the supposed one-stop shop rules have been drafted, they would not necessarily result in a single point of contact. You could have multiple points of contact. For example, if a cloud data center is in one country, but the head office for management purposes is in a second country, and maybe uh, the main customer base is in a third country, and you can carry on adding permutations to that with um, subcontractors and so on, then there may be several regulators who believe they should be the primary point of contact. Um, the third point I want to just mention briefly about the proposed reform of EU data protection law is this suggestion um, that transborder data flows can still be regulated in the way that the, the re regulations so far have tried to do so and failed. The idea that before somebody uploads data to a cloud service or downloads data, if it includes personal data, that may well involve a regulated export of personal data. And the rules for complying uh, with that are very uh, complex and cumbersome and are not in practice complied with in, I would say, most cases. Those rules would be preserved and further developed and strengthened under the proposed new regulation. That I do not think is realistic uh, or at all helpful in terms of protecting individuals or enabling responsible users of cloud services to do so in a way that is compliant with the law. Thanks for listening.